When is the last time Carson Castles had a cash tournament? I've been playing for a little over a year and I've never seen one. Basically, esports for CNC is kind of like toilet paper when everyone was trapped inside. It doesn't exist. Due to this, I decided to host a cash tournament called the Rat Cup. The rules were pretty simple. You had to run three base rats, three rat hovels, and three flame storms. Six flame storms possible a game, pure destruction. There was also a ban on legendaries and dragon's fire. It was free to enter and had a $50 US prize. On top of that, if the winner ran three vermin tunnels throughout the tournament, they would receive an extra 50 US dollars. I will be casting the semifinals and final match for your viewing pleasure today, so you can see which strategy came out on top. At the end, I will be announcing the next tournament rules and prize. Let's get into the matches. This is the first semi-final match, Jump against Jasper. And Jump's opening hand is looking pretty good. He's got a really nice curve. I don't know if he's going to trade anything out here. He's thinking about trading out the Blacksmith. Maybe. Maybe the Armory? I think the Blacksmith is... Yeah. Since he has Queen for Armory. And he gets another 2-drop. I, I would coin for the 2-drop at this point. Um that okay he's just gonna pass so never mind we're gonna give up the early aggression and play more for the long game um and another flame prince coming in so not playing flame prince on turn one is a little bit interesting just because flame prince grows and grows and grows so the longer you have it on the board the better we see a southport captain from jasper a very good opening play for him um immediately getting himself six gold next turn which means he could pop out a cannon here on turn four and that would be a huge threat to jump and jump's going to go ahead and put out a elvish thief which gets feared um so no southport cannoneer from jasper looks like he's going to do a uh a salahar rider and then a dark dungeon so jasper has put first range unit on the board and range in this format is pretty big um just because otk is a very very viable strategy um, for taking out your opponent's castle. Now, Jump's thinking here, he could put down an armory and then trade and just pass turn. Like maybe trade the uh, the Elvish that he could put out a Southport next turn without having to use his coin. Um, but he's thinking about fearing instead. Okay, so we're going to go for the fear. I would put the rat into the south. Okay, never mind. So we're going to save the rat. I, I, I guess that does make sense, actually. So... He's thinking here, uh, maybe coin for armory and then pass. No, he's going to go for the flame prince instead and then pass over. Now, Jasper, if he has a way to sack this, oh, he does. He does have a way to sack the Salhar Rider. Okay, that is a great play from Jasper. So going for the grotesque, knowing that he has a very high chance of getting one of those flame princes and then getting draw on top of that. That was an excellent play. And now he's going to run in that Southport captain and make jump deal with that so jump is going to go for a southport cannoneer for his turn that's a very strong play um if there's one thing that can beat out dark vendor in this format it's cannoneer uh it's just a, a chunky boy it's much more chunky than the dark vendor is now that does come with the cost but jasper seems to disregard the cannoneer and just run his northlands ranger down which is an interesting proposition when you're facing down a five range attack i think he should have been a little bit more careful with that ranger maybe put it one square back from where it is um that seems to be just a free hit on that for jump here so just whittling down that big threat that the northland ranger poses and that's misplay by jump jump put down army after he hit um, which means that now the uh, the Northlands Ranger can survive a flame storm if it comes down. Um, that that may actually be a big deal. Um, I that that does happen actually quite a bit where a player will make a trade and then figure out that oh global is the move and put down a global. Um, now granted. I think he may have been weighing the odds of pulling something else off of the fear, and that's why he traded and then feared, but it just turned out that the uh, the 
armory was the best play. So now we're going to see that Northland Ranger get taken out, providing no value at all to Jasper besides soaking two Cannoneer hits. And then the Rat is going to go in for a trade, and then Witchbolt is going to come in afterwards to clean up. And now Jump is going to extend his range lead with another Dark Bender. Yes. So right now, Jump just has a dominant board position. He has the Armory, he has the Rat Hovel, and he has the Cannoneer and the Dark Bender. And all Jasper has to compete with this is just one Dark Bender on the board, which isn't even enough to trade properly with the Cannoneer. Now, if Jasper does have a Flamestorm, that would be a pretty good proposition for him. Uh, it does not appear that he does. He's instead going to go for, okay, he's buffed up the Dark Bender enough to trade with that Cannoneer. But that still leaves him with some problems here. Uh, namely, these buffed rats coming in. And then the uh, the Dark Bender that Jump has down on the board as well. And it looks like Jump may just go for a double Dark Bender this turn. Um, and these rats coming out of this hovel are just shaping up to be a massive threat for Jasper. Um, and just a lot of value for Jump. So we're going to see a Dark Vendor come out here. Are we gonna see, oh wait, we're not going to see a second one because the, uh, the Blacksmith came down. So right now, things are looking pretty bad for Jasper here. He's going to go for the trade with the Blacksmith into the Grotesque, looking for anything to help him out here. I don't know what he can pull though. An Acolyte, that's not going to be enough. Uh, another Blacksmith coming down, a base Rat, a Salhar Rider. So we see a lot of small things in his hand, but I think uh, it's a little bit a little bit unlucky for him that he didn't have this in the early game, these, uh, these smaller units. And they're showing up now in the late game, which is where you want to be putting out your bigger units. Um, we may just see Jump trade into both of these smaller units just to get them off the board, and then perhaps set up another Dark Bender. Another Dark Bender would be an interesting play. Jasper gets the castle, uh, which I don't think is what he wanted, since if he has a Flamestorm in hand, it would have been much better for him if that went on, say, one of the uh, the Rat Hobble or Armory. But we do see the third Dark Bender <laughs> for, for Jump coming down, and this looks like it's spelling doom for Jasper, uh, since three Dark Benders is three Dark Benders too many. Um, and Jasper is responding though with range units of his own, so he puts down a wizard and dark bender, but they're just not enough to match the uh, the the baselines of Jump's dark benders. And it looks like he's going to go for the witch bolt to eliminate the stat boost for Jump's range units, and then just freely trade with them. Uh, he could also just go for twelve straight up to castle, which I think may be the play here since you're going into sudden death. However, that comes with the caveat of there may be an OTK up Jasper's sleeve, but he could use that third Dark Bender to trade with the Dark Bender threatening his castle. And that would uh, definitely stall any kind of OTK that could happen. So I think the move I would make here would be double go into castle and then trade with that last Dark Bender. Jump's going to take a little bit more of a conservative route and do one into castle, one trade with Dark Bender, and one trade with the remaining range unit therefore spawning a zombie, and then he's going to block with his Elvish Thief. So Jasper only has two cards in hand. He's going to draw a third, but I don't think he will have enough, unless he has Triple Flamestorm. Triple Flamestorm solves all problems <laughs> anytime. Uh, all, all you need is Triple Flamestorm. He has to expend the Bolt to get rid of that, and he's going to go for Daggerstorm RNG, which he is unlucky, and that is going to be lethal since Jump has a line with two Dark Benders to castle. So that is going to wrap up our first semi-final match with Jump moving on to the finals. And we have the second semi-final match, Z-Tech PL versus Techno Geek. Now, Z-Tech has a very interesting board background, and he's going to trade out an armory. And we see here he's got a Blacksmith, a Fear, a Vampire, and a Blue Fireball. Uh, we see Techno put out a Lumberjack, um, which also has a, a very interesting overlay. Um, now, Z-Tech's going to pull a Fear, so he can go ahead and Fear the Lumberback, and then maybe Fear at another. I, I would use the second Fear. 
he may save it, may use it. It is, it's really a coin flip. There's no wrong way to go about this. Since you're going to get the Elvish Thief value next turn, um, you can't get it this turn, which is rather unfortunate for him that he didn't have a uh, an Elvish Thief in the opening hand. I have to say, for this format, Elvish Thief is incredibly strong because it is just uh, an absolute unit against these types of 1-1 rats. So he's going to opt for the Blue Fire against the Rat Hobble, which, you know, th that's a fine play to make. Um, he just wants to shut it down before it can really make production. We see a Bitcoin come out, or a Medal of Bravery. <laughs> and Techno Geek is just, he is on a roll here. Really, really strong start from Techno. Um, all of these base rats from his hand, the Lumberjack, the uh, the Faithful Drake, and Zetex really in a pinch for what he's going to do. Uh, I would say Elvish Thief would be the correct play here. Um, just to get a little bit off board. You could go for an Onslaught and then try to find a Flamestorm off of that. But I think you need the uh, the gold for next turn. Uh, I think you have to go for that uh, that that Elvish Thief. Also, it helps you clear off a little bit of the damage that's going to be coming at your face. And he has to trade another unit in for it. Uh, otherwise, you can threat a global next turn. And that would clean off the faithful without really having to uh, to do too much. It's basically just a free faithful and gold ramp, um, or just one card for that. Now, Zetek looks to be getting a free turn, and he's going to go for the uh, the flamestorm play here. Top deck flamestorm is very good for him, and I'm assuming Techno maybe had a vampire in hand or something, since he didn't play anything. And it was turn four. Four gold. What can he have that's over four gold? I'm assuming he drew the faithful. Yeah, it looks like he drew the faithful. Oh, oh, that Dorvin scope. That's that's value. He can put that on either a dark bender or a vampire. And this vampire, this vampire is big. Um, Zetex is going to get a lot of value out of this, I think. I don't know what Techno can really do here. I mean, he's got the base rats coming out, but he needs uh, something like a blacksmith to buff those up. And he's got a sour port. I'm assuming his hand is full of the, uh, the larger units. Now, the thing here is, Z-Tech can just Dorvin scope his vampire and then trade for free with the cannoneer. Yeah, that, that's just free. That is absolutely free for him because the, the vamp, it just it heals him back up. And we see Zetek going in with the blacksmith, just trying to soak up all the value. I think he's worried about uh, Techno maybe having like two blacksmiths or something like that, which would be able to kill the vampire if there were a lot of base rats on the board. But instead, we're going to see double flamestorm come down. I think that's a miscalculation, uh, judging by the uh, the emoting. Um, Techno, I think, thought that he could trade for the vampire because it has base five for health but he forgot about the uh, the plus one from the scope. That is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, I don't know about that. I probably would have gone for a rat trade there, but I guess the Onslaught gives you a card to draw. And he did get a, um, a Dark Bender off of it, which now he has lethal next turn. So Z-Tech Z -Tech can just kill Techno next turn. Um, no, that, that's going to be game. That that was an excellent match. That, that was... Uh, just a super strong start from Techno, but Z-Tech manages to pull through and move on to the finals. For our final match, we have Jump against Z-Tech PL. Jump's opening hand is looking pretty strong. He's going to remove the Grotesque and the Flamestorm, keeping a Flame Prince and a Wizard. That is a very strong opening since he can go for the Flame Prince turn one if he wishes. We didn't see him do that in the semifinals. So I don't know if he'll do that now, and he does not. He's going to opt to play the long game once again. We're going to see a aggressive Elvish Thief from Z-Tech, and that makes sense as a play for him. Now, Jump is going to go for a Wizard in response. If Z-Tech has a Bolt, this Wizard is going to be gone, and the Elvish Thief is going to be on Castle. And that's a very scary proposition. Since an Elvish Thief on Castle turn 3, that's a guaranteed 2 gold unless you have a burn to remove it. 
Now we're not going to see the bolt from Z-Tech. He's going to have to play this a little bit more passively, fearing the wizard back and playing his Elvish Thief in still a very dominant position, not allowing Jump to move his wizard up too aggressively. Now this turn, I think we're going to see the Elvish Thief move back and the wizard move up. We're going to see an onslaught come onto the wizard here. And yes, the Elvish Thief does move back, giving a little bit more ground for Jump to take advantage of. Jump's sitting on two fears, a Blacksmith, a Flame Prince, an Armory, and a White Knight. What does he play on turn four? I think he's going to opt for a White Knight. Yes, he goes for the White Knight. That makes sense as a play, since... There's no need to play the armory. The wizard is not in danger of dying just yet. So saving the armory for next turn, maybe comboing up with something like a fear to gain a board advantage makes a lot of sense. Now, Z-Tech is thinking through his options here. What can he do? He's going to play a dark vendor, which is going to be very advantageous for him. Since Jump's board position is currently decaying, he's going to lose his range unit in a few turns here. And Z-Tech is establishing a range presence on the board in the form of his Dark Vendor. So that is an excellent play by him. I imagine we're going to see the Armory come down to prolong the wizard stay on the board. Yes, the Armory is going to go down behind the castle. And I imagine the wizard is going to move up directly in front of the castle as well. I don't think the white knight is going to see any movement. Maybe he moved off to the side. No, no, the white knight is going to stay where he is. Basically, jump is offering a free four hit um, onto the white knight from the dark feather. But he has the blacksmith in his hand and he knows that his range unit is going to be gone in just two turns. So he's trying to force a range trade, which would be very advantageous for him if he could just play his blacksmith down and then trade with Dark Bender. I don't know if Z-Tech is going to fall for the trade, but it's pretty obvious that Jump wants something from this Dark Bender. And we're going to see a Southport Cannoneer come down. This is pretty big. This is very big for Z-Tech since he is establishing a dominant range position on this board. And Jump does have the Lifesteal units, but Lifesteal's big weakness is against range. So we'll see how this turns out. Jump's going to opt to go for a Rat Hobble, which makes sense. He's going to start building a Swarm position here. And then I imagine he'll go for a second White Knight or a Flame Prince. I'm not a huge fan of him playing another blacksmith since there's no real need. He doesn't need more globals on the board right now. He's not doing any trading. That's better to save it as a surprise for later. We're going to see a flame prince go down and then him trading the wizard into castle, which makes sense. Now, is he going to go for the micro prevention by fearing back? this Elvish Thief. I think he is. He doesn't want Z-Tech to get that one gold next turn. So Z-Tech is not getting anything for free here. And we see a wizard cycle into Jump's hand, which is an excellent cycle for him, since he really does need to start matching Z-Tech's range presence on this board with his current wizard decaying next turn. We see a bolt go down onto the hovel, which means that Jump no longer has the option to swarm here, and we see an onslaught go down onto the blacksmith, which means that Jump's global position is going to start decaying as well. So onslaught is doing a lot of work for Z-Tech this game, giving him a lot of advantage because he keeps on drawing cards off of those onslaughts. We see Dwarven Scope come into Jump's hand, which could be pretty big um, with these globals he has down on the board. I imagine we'll see a wizard white knight combo come down this turn just establishing more of a board presence he's going to maybe move the wizard up one square which would allow z-tech to play a global and a scope and take that wizard out for free 
I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of that play. Maybe he should have left the wizard next to the castle instead of moving it up one. But we'll see how it pans out. It's not extremely likely that ZTech has that global Dormant Scope combo. But it is eight gold next turn, so he could have a armory and a scope or a blacksmith and a scope. And either of those would get the job done and most likely seal the game in ZTech's favor. We're going to see the White Knight come down. I don't see a reason not to. Yes. And then we see it back up his current White Knight, making sure that the Southport Cannoneer can't get any free trades, which is an excellent uh, positioning move by Jump here. Now in Z-Tech's turn, he really has to consider here his options. What is he going to do? Does he trade with the Wizard? If he has a global, he is free to trade with the Wizard. And that leaves him with the only range unit on the board, which would be very advantageous for him. If he has something like an armory, he gets the additional benefit of having his Dark Vendor left on the board. We're going to see a Blacksmith and a Rat Hall will come down, and then a trade with the Wizard. Okay, so we are neutralizing Jump's range presence and leaving a Southport Cannoneer on Z-Tech's side of the board. Now, he definitely does have advantage here just from the range unit, but Jump does have a Dorvin Scope in his hand with a Blacksmith. So we'll see if he finds any way to turn the tide against Z-Tech here. Now, with the draw, Jump gets a Grotesque Offering. He's going to go for a Fear onto the South Fork, gets a Rat Hobble. He probably wants to play the Rat Hobble this turn, and then maybe go for a Grotesque on the Rat. He is going to be behind in rat production over Z Tech though here. Actually, he should probably grotesque the blacksmith since that is expired next turn. So I imagine we're going to see a grotesque play onto this blacksmith, although it looks like he's going to move it, maybe. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, you go for the grotesque here. And all right, excellent play by Jump. He goes for the grotesque and he receives a. Ooh, that's a big, big hit. He got a Swordsman and a Southport Cannoneer. Those are some of the cards he needed to see um, to stop this absolute dominance from z -Tech with regard to rain. Now, a swordsman Dorvin scope combo could be pretty scary coming down the board, especially with these globals. We are going to see the... Elvis Thief move up and threaten Jump's Hobble unless he trades Blacksmith or blocks with something else. And we may see a fear come in from Z-Tech to clear that Hobble. I'm quite interested here. And ooh, we see a Northland Ranger come down, move up and protect the Cannoneer. And I think Z-Tech made that play because he knows Jump has used most of his fears. So Jump doesn't have many options he's used two already and it's very unlikely that jump will have his third fear to be able to capitalize on this positioning here and then we see a double southport captain running up z tech is really putting on the board pres pressure here i'm very interested to see how jump responds I imagine we may see a Southport Cannoneer and a Blacksmith, and then some trading with these Southport Captains. We're going to see a Rat trade for sure. And then I think we may just see a Blacksmith trade into the Elvish Thief there, although we may see the White Knight relocate to protect that Rat Hobble. This is a very close game. And positioning is what is going to make or break this for either player. Any small mistake with positioning will spell defeat. We are going to see the Blacksmith retreat and the White Knight move over. That is a risky proposition, leaving this much aggression on the board for Z-Tech. And yeah, we're going to see a lot of shifting trying to protect the castle and giving a free hit to this rat against the Cannoneer. I don't know how this will turn out. Z-Tech also has 
12 gold to use this turn from his Southport captain. That two treasure last turn, that could be big. He has a lot of leeway. And if he has a scope, things could go badly. He's going to move up. That means he wants to take an eight hit on Castle. Oh, no, he wants to clear White Knight. I don't know why we did it that order. That seems like a misplay. If he wanted to take out that White Knight, he should have just moved the Ranger first. And then... I I don't know why he did that. That, that was very odd. So the reason that was a misplay is he could have kept the Southport Cannoneer back one square and out of danger if he had just moved the ranger first and then moved the Southport Cannoneer afterwards. The only reason he should have moved up the Cannoneer was if he wanted to take an eight hit on Castle, which he did. So that was a definite misplay there. And now we're going to see big Swordsman Valley coming onto the board for jump. That is absolutely massive for him. And that may just change the course of the, the game here. That That is huge value. Now, it's rather interesting that we saw hit the captain there instead of hitting the spite fish. I think that was a rather interesting play since the Southport Cannoneer should have probably hit the spite fish. Maybe he jumps trying to conserve gold for next turn. But he's still offering a trade. No, I think he should have kept his swordsman at max health there by trading the... Yeah, he, he should have traded the white knight into the Southport captain and then put the cannoneer into the spite fish. Since he would have had a lot more pressure with his swordsman. Now the swordsman takes three. Maybe a Flamestorm and a Bolt comes down to clear it, and then you don't have that pressure anymore. Jump does have a very dominant board position here, though, so I don't know how this is going to go. Yep, okay, we see the Flamestorm come down. Do we see a Bolt? Another... F oh, okay. Well, that, that double Flamestorm is devastating. That is absolutely devastating for Jump. And to think he would have been able to have a scope on a swordsman if he had just put the cannoneer into the into the spite fish this is by no means over yet though because jump still has a range unit on the board with a dorvin scope in hand ztec does have a blacksmith though he is seeing a lumberjack come down so we'll see if the lumberjack can give any value this is a close match and we see a witch ball come in that's a big play for Z-Tech. We see a Flamestorm in Jump's hand. I imagine we see the Flamestorm, another Flamestorm draw. I imagine we see, just see the Flamestorm whiteboard, even though Z-Tech will be getting a card off it. And now it is hitting Sun Death. Z-Tech gets double draw. He has 10 gold and three cards in hand. We'll see what he decides to do with it. Putting down a Dark Bender. That is not what Jump wanted to see at all. And another Spite Fish. These are some big plays for Z-Tech. Jump does get his third fear, which could be massive. That can prevent an OTK here. I think he wants to fear... I think he wants to fear the smite, Spite Fish and then play the Southport Cannoneer in front of the castle. I think that is the play. The only thing Z-Tech can do to gain advantage of a play like that is play a Scope and a Demonic Rage or a Double Buff. The question is which thing to fear because you need the card draw before you decide what to play so you've got to fear something i think you go for the spite fish that is the fear that makes sense here jump is really thinking through his options spite fish or dark bender he's going to go for the dark bender i think that is most likely a misplay now z can bolt the Southport Cannoneer. Yeah, I think that is, that, that's a definite best play in my book. I think Jump's just trying to close out this game and he's gambling. He's gambling that z doesn't have, oh, and there comes in a scope. That is as good as a blue fire bolt. That's huge. 
that's that and we see the bolt come in that means Tech is just gonna go for castle here no he's not gonna go for castle he's gonna go for board oh oh c tech he is he's putting down the uh the the beat down on jump here and jump's gonna see a rat come into hand the swordsman that's 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 gotta be game i don't see jump coming back from this He's going to put the Swordsman directly in front of Castle, but if Z-Tech has another scope or a fear, that's just game. You've got to put in front of Castle. You you lose if you don't. Or, wait, you have a Rat. I guess you put Rat behind. I feel like there's going to be a burn inbound. This, this game. Oh, it's so close. And there's the blue fire. Yeah, you should have put the Swordsman behind. Oh, that was such a close game. That could have gone either way. Wow. Okay. And there you have it. The winner of the Rat Cup was ZTech PL. And everyone who participated in the Rat Cup received a role in the new Tourney server I created. Along with Jump and ZTech PL gaining extra roles because they were the finalists. And then on top of all of that, ZTech received $50 as his prize. Now, he did not run three Vermin Tunnels, so he did not get an extra $50 for that. But there we go. That's the, the conclusion of the Rack Cup. And thank you, everybody who participated in it. It was an absolute blast to run. And I had so much fun that we're going to have another one. And as you saw earlier in the video, it will be called the Cock and Cup. The rules are pretty straightforward. You must run three Cockatrice and three Hungering Pumpkin. You are not allowed to run any units besides those six units. This includes the Hassan City Guard Tower and Eye of Flame. You cannot run either of those since they count as units. I know they're buildings, but they count as units. So you are not allowed to run them. Those are the only deck rules. Now, the tournament will be best of one format all the way through. It is going to be free to enter, and there will be a prize of $75, 50 going to the first place, and 25 going to the second place. I will put a link to the tournament server in the description. I'll also put a link to the Cards of Castles 1 Discord and the Cards of Castles 2 Discord, so you guys can come hang out. And yeah, this was an absolute blast to run again. I had so much fun, and I hope to see more of you competing in the second tournament thank you guys so much for watching i would really appreciate if you liked and subscribed 